My talk is a little bit more esoteric because, of course, unlike, unlike the uh, previous speakers, I don't have a lot of data and evidence to present. So I've got a lot of pretty pictures and, and things like that. What I'm hoping to talk about today is the specifics of right heart failure and right ventricular failure as well. Now, I have no disclosures, and the objectives of today's talk is to try to go over some distinct characteristics of the right ventricle and its role in compensated and decompensated right heart failure, review some of the diagnostic and management approaches to right ventricular failure, and uh, I will not address specifically adult congenital heart disease or the arrhythm arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, because of course those are topics uh, which are too large for a talk like this. So going over the definition itself, the International Right Heart Failure Foundation Scientific Working Group suggested that to better look at it, it's a clinical syndrome which is due to an alteration of structure and or function of the right heart circulatory system. It is to suboptimal delivery of blood, high or low, to the pulmonary circulation, and or, and this is a very important part, elevated venous pressures at rest or with exercise. Just so that we are on the same page, when you talk about heart uh, the right heart system, we're really talking about the pulmonary circulation as well as the systemic venous circulation as well, all of which includes the right ventricle, which at the end of it all is probably the more important part of the right heart system. Now, many people would say that the RV is no more than just a wimpier left ventricle. That's not quite true. There are quite a few differences, not only anatomically, but otherwise as well. The more important anatomical differential is that the fibers of the muscles are longitudinal apex to base, and that, of course, is very important because about 30% of RV contractility comes from the septal contraction, which is, of course, mediated by what happens in the left ventricle. But there's also physiologic differences, a low-pressure system, much more sensitive to afterload uh, problems. And because it's also more compliant, on the flip side is it's also more susceptible to forces from outside uh, of the actual heart itself seeing that in pericardial tamponade, for example, the RV and the RA are more commonly affected than the L, uh, LV. This, uh, metabolically as well, it's again different because his response to pressure overload are very different in the left ventricle, and I'm not gonna go into details, and some gene expression uh, genes as well. Regardless of these distinct characteristics, at the end of the day, most people don't really think of the right ventricle very well, and Francois Fontaine didn't really help us because he said, hey, congenital heart disease patients, we can just bypass the right ventricle and it'll be just fine, and people work. So he actually made it look like the RV really didn't do anything. Well, the truth is, however, that uh, in 1993, the uh, uh, German group from Zuhender and all showed that if you have a myocardial infarction and your RV is involved, then your mortality is quite high. In those days, of course, before fibrinolytic therapy, the mortality was 30%. And Dr. Hein Wellens, as you all know from the Wellens syndrome you see on the EKG, even wrote an editorial at the time saying that those patients had a risk of dying in hospital that was seven to eight times that for patients with acute inferior wall infarctions that did not have evidence of right ventricular involvement. Now, since 1993, we've come a long way with perfusion therapies and whatnot have done very much. Regardless of that, unfortunately, even in the modern era of reperfusion in primary PCI, for example, if you have a right ventricular involvement, your mortality is much greater than if you had a very large anterior wall infarction. Even in etiologies like the stress cardiomyopathy, whereby we know that 90%, 95% of patients recover and the mortality is actually quite low, if you have RV involvement, not only have increased uh, overall endpoints, including rehospitalization and heart failure, but in hospital mortality, even in Takotsubo's cardiomyopathy, goes from 1.1% to about 14%, which is, of course, quite a bit more. And that also happens to be the case in pulmonary emboli, which, of course, is a significant cause of RV dysfunction. If you have a pulmonary embolus with RV involvement, your overall odds ratio goes up and you have about 2.6-fold increased risk of dying from a pulmonary embolus if you have RV involvement versus if you didn't. So what I'm trying to do is make a point. If you have chronic and acute RV dysfunction, in many cardiopulmonary pathologies, such as I mentioned, we have associated increased mortality. What does that mean? To me, it means that RV dysfunction is probably a very important prognostic tipping point. If you have RV dysfunction, no matter what it is that you're dealing with, that means you are going to be a lot higher risk than if you didn't. 
From the causes of RV failure, there are many. I can probably list dozens and dozens. But ultimately speaking, it comes down to an increased RV after, after load. Anything that reduces RV contractility and therefore contraction, and of course, decrease RV preload, of course, are causes of, of right side of failure, or in this case, RV failure. Many of the ideologies, however, are interconnected because many of these ideologies will actually have parts in all three different pathophysiological processes. Now, I always have a slide on pathophysiology, which, of course, I have here. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. It does suffice to say, though, that you have hemodynamic as well as non-hemodynamic factors involved in RV failure leading to right, right heart failure as well. And the neurohormonal component of that, of course, is much more important than we give it credit for because a lot of the therapies that might be useful in RV failure might be targeting many of these other non-hemodynamic factors such as inflammation, especially mitochondrial dysfunction, but also the neurohormonal sympathetic nervous system, the renin-angiotensin aldosterone system, and of course the uh, natriuretic peptide system as well. So how do you make a diagnosis of RV failure? Well, at the very spectrum when there's no RV dysfunction or if there is severe RV dysfunction, it's fairly easy. But at the end of the day, to really be able to pick up most patients with right ventricular failure, you need to have a very high clinical suspicion. The most common and the, perhaps the most path pathognomonic symptom, or in this case sign, is systemic venous congestion. So patients complain of anorexia, abdominal bloating, nausea, and sometimes even constipation. And of course, the classic elevation in JVP, the, the tricuspid regurgitation that may be actually seen with a pulsatile liver, and of course, edema, ascites, and organomegaly. Now, of course, exercise intolerance, hypotension, and arrhythmias also occur, but oftentimes, this is probably the one symptom that patients will be complaining about. When you're assessing the RV, you have to also make sure you assess the right side, as I mentioned, as a totality. So the two questions that you ask is from a right ventricular assessment, you ask how well can the right ventricle respond to need, i.e., what's the reserve like? And the second one is how compensated the patient is, and this is really dealing more with right heart failure assessment. So the two questions that everyone that comes through your door or perhaps through your eMERGE door uh, needs to be uh, addressed for. How about actual assessments? Well, we have always non-invasive and invasive assessments. As far as non-invasive assessments, uh, echocardiography is the commonest one because it's the one that most of us will actually have access to. Now, what it does, it gives us some simple things like right atrial and right ventricular sizing and function. It looks at pulmonary arterial pressures, for example, gives us an assessment or at least an estimate of that. It also looks at slightly better measures like tricuspid annular systolic plane excursion or TAPSI which if it's great or less than 1.8, it suggests poor outcome. But it does have some better, perhaps a little bit more complex measures such as tissue Doppler uh, studies and strain measurements. And cardiac MRI, which of course is not as uh, widely available, is also very good at looking at a number of these things. The one problem with these two modalities, although they provide fairly good pictures and allows us to look at uh, some of the things in detail, they cannot assess for RV adaptation to loading conditions. I mean, it doesn't tell you what happens if the RV is overloaded or underfilled, as opposed to what it shows you, which is a one-point measure of a function. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of detail on this because my colleague, of course, is going to deal with echocardiography later on. But what I am going to show is that in situations when you have somebody like this, one of our patients who has severe, severe RV failure, you end up in a situation when you have simple measures. You have right ventricular ejection fraction, you have right ventricular fr uh, fractional area contraction, and all of those things are easily accessible, but they're not very good. Because as I mentioned, loading conditions are very dependent, so if you're very overloaded or underloaded, these RV measures of function uh, can vary significantly. The TAPC is a little bit better, but unfortunately is very poor when you have septal dysfunction. As I mentioned from the anatomy, the septum plays a big part in RV contractility. So if you have somebody, for example, who's post-bypass surgery where the septum is very often dysfunctional, the TAPSI becomes almost useless. Now, when you go on to something like strain, it much better reflects RV loading as well as dysfunction. Now, this is, um, this is the latter stage. I'm going to talk about a little bit of 
uh, RV strain. This is a three-dimensional strain measurement. And if you look at it, essentially, what you're looking for is the strain in during a uh, rest. And what you look for is changes over time. And in this particular case, normal versus severe pulmonary hypertension. And even if you know nothing about strain, just looking at these two images, you could tell that there's something quite different between a normal RV and the right ventricle for somebody with severe pulmonary hypertension. Cardiac MRI is something we do a lot in our center, and we actually have a number of uh, studies that we do, and we're quite adept at it. But it's very good because the resolution of the MR is very, very good. So it allows us to be able to delineate the ventricles very well, so you can actually easily assess ejection fraction, for example, or look at morphology and thickening and things like that as well. But what you can also do is do strain imaging on the MRI. And it does a very similar thing, but it looks at a circumferential strain and look at both negative and positive uh, strain, which, of course, the negative is the myocardial shortening and the positive is the uh, stretching. And then you look at not only the right and left ventricles, but the outlets in the septum as well. Now, one thing to, to note is that the MR imaging strain is actually quite different than echo. They don't seem to measure exactly the same thing. So if you look at correlation, they don't correlate very well. But they're both uh, measures that can be used when assessing specifically right ventricular function. Many of us now, however, are looking for different ways of doing it. Whatever we have so far isn't quite good enough. So there is something we call molecular imaging that's actually becoming much, much more uh, interesting over the last number of years. It's actually something that was going on in the 90s as well, but it's really been picked up. And what it is, is they look at an imaging modality that can then pick up a molecular process going on within the myocardia. This is an example of using FDG, which is glucose, of course, uh, PET scan, and looking at increased glucose metabolism in someone with pulmonary hypertension. As you can see here, is the RV, the right ventricle, is very, very metabolically active, suggesting that despite the fact that the LV is usually what we think of as the most active ventricle, in somebody who has a severe afterload increase, like in pulmonary hypertension, the right ventricle is using up quite a bit of glucose in this particular case. Ultimately speaking, though, because all of these modalities have shortcomings, we're more likely than not going to be dealing with an integrative hybrid imaging protocol, whereby you look at echocardiography for regional wall motion uh, and function, uh, looking at CT for morphological imaging, CMR for volumetric and functional analyses, and then PET scanning for molecular and perfusion imaging as well. And as an example of that, if you use the combination of MR and PET, in this particular case, you can see someone who's had an anterior wall infarct, and the gadolinium MR shows you a large area of enhancement, of course, which means infarction. Now, you do the PET scanning with N and ammonia. You can use all different kinds of markers. And in this case, it shows that there's indeed decrease or impaired myocardial flow over the same area. Now, going on to see other things, you can actually look at angiogenesis with PET by looking at triggers of integrins, for example. And in this case, it shows that even though that area is appear, apparently uh, enhanced, so maybe infarcted and injured, but also uh, with poor myocardial flow, there's a significant signal for angiogenesis in that area as well. And of course, it can make a nice pictures like this to kind of look at a polar map for myocardial flow. Suffice to say that ultimately speaking, this is probably where we're going to go. When you have a modality, when you have a ventricle, or in this case, a, a an anatomical structure that's difficult to characterize, a hybrid approach is oftentimes the best. The invasive measures, of course, are something that we have to consider. Whenever somebody's sick, we want to poke them. We want to put tubes in them. We want to do something with them because that makes us feel better. The question really comes down to, is this beneficial or not? The most common invasive measurement of uh, RV function is given uh, through a pulmonary arterial catheter. You can measure a lot of things, including pulmonary vascular resistance, preload CVP, which is a very, albeit gross, but very common and perhaps useful measure for uh, RV uh, function and loading. But you could also look at the work that the RV is doing with, with right ventricular stroke work index, which is a very easy calculation as long as you remember the numbers. But the other thing you can do, which is quite helpful in sp specifically in RV dysfunction, is that you can do assessments such as vasoreactivity, if you have somebody with pulmonary hypertension, for example. You could do exercise and volume challenges and then do a dynamic assessment during that time, which is not easy to do, but in the labs, for example, we'll have a, a big wheel that you attach to the cath lab table and people do it. 
in our VAT assessments, for example, we actually sometimes will just walk the patient standing up because we do a lot of procedures through the uh, cephalic vein as well. But the other thing that this PA catheter allows you to do is not only the monitoring, sort of the diagnostic part of things, but allows you to monitor and tailor uh, therapies. Now, many of us will remember that the SCAPE trial was quite disappointing because it showed that in patients who can uh, admitted with advanced uh, decompensated heart failure, the use of hemodynamic tailoring via PA catheter really was not beneficial. But we need to remember that this, these populations were very different. The RV population was never specifically looked at, and they are much more likely to be susceptible to hemodynamic changes and otherwise uh, regular heart failure patients. This is just an example which I'll bypass here for the sake of time. But the gold standard from an invasive assessment point of view is the pressure volume loop. Now, how many of you have you done this, or how, when's the last time you did it? Uh, it's been years since I've done it. But it's still nevertheless the best measure of how the RV is going to contract, so looking at true reserve and true response. But unfortunately, because it is very cumbersome, it's not, not oftentimes done. Now, one slide on the right heart failure assessment. Now, I've talked about right ventricular assessment so far. From a clinical standpoint, from a right heart failure assessment, you really want to look at how congested they are. The usual things you do in clinic, look at the JVP, ask them how they're feeling. But the important also thing that we don't do as often as we should is watch for bladder pressures. I'll be talking a lot more about this during my second talk later on in the uh, early afternoon. But this is something that it is not done and probably should be. And of course, looking at other organ uh, involvement as well. There are a lot of predictive scores, but these are not really good for the regular population. Most of these come from the VAD literature, so I'm not gonna talk about that. So last few minutes, I'm gonna talk about management, and the goals are fairly simple. You look at volume optimization, afterload reduction, improving right ventricular anotropy, and of course, treating the underlying precipitating factor or cause. Now, there are two slides I'm gonna show. This is actually from a very nice paper from Francois Haddad, uh, one of our colleagues at Stanford, who, uh, who also happens to be a Canadian, even though he's working in the US, um, talking about chronic heart failure and so on. Suffice to say, in the chronic right heart failure situation, the biggest thing is, one, if it's a left-sided concomitant disease, treat that as per guidelines, or look for the underlying cause, whatever it be, whether it be pulmonary hypertension, whether it be tetralogy of fallot, or a systemic RV, or something like that, you treat the underlying cause. And that's probably the best way you can treat these patients with long-term. It's in the acute setting where things become a little bit more difficult and interesting because there's very little data as to what we're trying to do. Yes, you look for the etiology, and yes, you talk about therapies, but many of these really aren't helpful. So I'm gonna just spend the last few minutes exploring some of these therapy options. Number one, fluid optimization. It used to be told that patients with heart failure need higher filling pressures. We now know from the data that's not true. If you aim for CVP from five to eight, that's plenty of fluid for people to get a good preload onto the uh, left side. And if it's not getting there, it's because you won't. Volume loading, it's to be done very, very slowly because if you go too fast, the RV can actually decompensate. And of course, there are many different ways you can actually change the volume uh, from diuretics to otherwise. Specific as far as diuretics are concerned, we use it because it works, but it is not necessarily a very good thing because it can cause sometimes problems with neurohormone activation especially if the rate of diuresis, notice I said rate, not actual overall diuresis, because patients may still be overloaded, but if you take it out too fast, the intravascular volume will contract, and in that case of course, uh, cause neurohormonal activation. Now infusions, the data seems to suggest from those studies that it doesn't work as well, but we do know that actually uh, in the RV population, it may be slightly better. Pulmonary vasodilators, inhaled nitric oxide, we use it often can be done without intubation, non-invasively with just a mask, but it is very much so that we use it with somebody who's got pulmonary hypertension. But as of late, we're starting to use it in patients with a right ventricular myocardial infarction and shock because there's some evidence suggesting that may be beneficial. Our center does, our group does a lot of work with uh, PD-5 inhibitors, with Viagra, which of course is a butt of jokes for a lot of people. But ultimately speaking, we found that there's RV contractility benefits by using sildenafil in patients who have RV hypertrophy, which is commonly seen in patients with pulmonary hypertension. And this is something that has led us to use this much more frequently in our population as well. How about ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and beta blockers, and the usual? Unfortunately, there's very little evidence, if any, 
that is beneficial or whatnot. Specifically with ACE inhibitors, there's really no evidence that in RV failure this is beneficial. If anything, it may actually be towards harm. But in Carvitolol's case, there may be a slight benefit, but again, it's not something that's very well maintained. As far as anotropic agents, this is just a slide I put that to tell you that things work very differently. Every one of them has characteristics. But suffice to say that most commonly, the butamine is the one that we'll be using because that's the one that's most studied and the one that at least hasn't harmed and killed people as much as some of the other ones we have. Mechanical fluid removal is important and oftentimes necessary because it allows you a more gradual loss of fluid and something that we do either with ultrafiltration or with continuous di uh, dialysis. And uh, although the unload and caress HF study looking at ultrafiltration did not show benefit, again, it did not address specifically right ventricular or right heart failure. A couple of things that we don't really think about. AV synchrony as well as biventricular synchrony is actually quite important in the RV because it's such so much, such much, so more, such more, a lot more dependent, sorry, a lot more dependent on volume and loading, you need to really make sure that the atrium is kicking stuff into, or fluid, in this case blood, into the ventricle. And bradycardia is also very poorly tolerated. And also because septic contraction, as I mentioned, accounts for 30% of the RV contraction, if you lose, if you have septo asynchrony, there may be a significant harm as well. So it may be, specifically in the congenital population, in the CRT may be beneficial. What do we do at the end? When you do all of these things, it's not uncommon for you not to have any significant benefits. So in our center, we're very quick to move on to assist devices and eventually, of course, transplantation. The common one we do in the cath lab, which is easy because I can do that in the cath lab percutaneously, is put patients on ECMO. We have very good results because we do it often and quickly. And we do that with uh, smaller cannulas than usually done because uh, we find that we can get a good flow. And we're using it just as a bridging to something else. But there are a couple of other things that we've done in the past. A PropTech Duo is something that we don't currently have, but we're actually going to start using it as well, which is a specific percutaneous right ventricular assist device that allows you to put up about four, four, maybe even five plus liters through the right ventricle and is put in percutaneously. And it could actually even be put in in the CCU rather than in the cath lab. And the more uh, traditional Centromag, which is of course a true uh, assist device that can actually be used. Transplantation of course can be and should be considered in patients who have refractory right ventricular failure. But most commonly than not, we'll bridge these people to that point <coughs> with uh, an assist device. So what do you do? You avoid bad things. non hydroperiodic -hydro calcium channel blockers and NSAIDs and of course, you look, make sure, you, if you are ventilating them, that you avoid things that actually change or decrease preload. Balloon pumps, only if they're severe MR, should we consider. And ICDs, really not found to be beneficial, unless, of course, you, you have a uh, tetralogy of flow, or, and then in ARVC as well, if, of course, there's uh, a history of dysrhythmias as well. Little things like vaccines, counseling, you know, vaccines, flu and pneumovax, counseling, Pregnancy should be contraindicated if it's severe RV dysfunction and avoiding travel above 5,000 feet. And exercise is a good thing. Maybe what I'll do is, uh, time is running out, I'll stop there and then uh, open up a couple questions at the end. Thank you.